Okay, <clears throat> let's get started. So I'm recording. Um, let's see, a few announcements. I think um, Jedi One is due tomorrow. Is that correct? Um, I don't have my I don't have my canvas open, but I think it's tomorrow that uh, Jedi One Point is due. <clears throat> There will be an office hour tomorrow morning at 1030 if you have uh, issues with Jedi One. Um, hope you're not. hope everything's working out fine there. Um, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's move over to the course web page. So, um, Let's see, here we are way down here, April 16th. Um, yeah, and we're just starting. Um, I think we're pretty much on schedule. I mean, this feels about right. Uh, <clears throat> I'll set a date for uh, Jedi 3 um, when I get a better feel for what's realistic there. Uh, meanwhile, let's go over and take a look at. Um, Jedi, we're not going to look at Jedi 3 today, we're going to look at Jedi 2. So <clears throat> Jedi 3 is an extension of Jedi 2, so you have to build Jedi 2 on top of Jedi 1. So this will all just be part of your Jedi project, and then Jedi 3 will be built on top of Jedi 2. So, <clears throat> Hope everybody's ready to start looking at Jedi 2. Jedi 2 is where things start getting interesting with Jedi, even though it's a fairly easy extension of uh, Jedi 1. You should be able to get it pretty quickly. There are some extra features uh, that are a little bit tricky, but the, the initial part, there's a Jedi 2.1 actually, that I'm also gonna have you do. All Jedi 2 does is it adds user-defined functions and blocks to uh, the Jedi language. And we're seeing that in this little demo right here. So a block is just any sequence of expressions separated by semicolons and bracketed by curly braces. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> the value of a block is the value of the last expression in the block. So this block here has got the expressions one, two, and three. One, two, and three, they are, they are literal expressions. So remember, uh, a number is both an expression and a value. And uh, the value of a literal expression, when you execute a literal, its value is literally itself. That's why they're called literal. I said literal enough times. Literally, I have. <clears throat> So the value of this expression is three, because that's the last one. The value of this expression is six, and three plus six is nine down here. What happened to the one, two, four, and five? Well, they drifted off into cyberspace somewhere because I didn't really do anything with them. We'll see uh, that blocks, though, have, so this is called a block. Blocks have, uh, one of the uses of a block is to take several expressions and group them as a single expression. Next comes a uh, function definition. <clears throat> so here I'm defining cube and the right hand side, this is the syntax for creating a function. Okay, so we use the word lambda, <clears throat> lambda and then uh, and then in parentheses, we have a comma separated list of uh, parameters for lambda. Okay, this one just has one parameter x. And then this part here is called the body of the lambda. <clears throat> so this is the function that takes an input x and multiplies x by itself three times, i.e. it's the cube function. <clears throat> Why is uh, you might have noticed that lambda, you know, and probably some of your other professors too, it's like kind of a, a popular Greek letter among computer scientists. Why is that? Well, that's because uh, it's in honor of lambda calculus. <clears throat> lambda calculus was uh, a programming language uh, developed in the 1930s 
by, uh, by a mathematician named Haskell Curry, who is working uh, also with, uh, this is also during the time, the same time and place at Princeton with, uh, with Alan Turing, who hopefully you've heard of Alan Turing. Um, Alan Turing was, uh, they were like trying to really develop these early computer languages. Uh, Alan Turing developed Turing machines, um, which you study uh, in CS154. And Haskell Curry developed uh, Lambda Calculus. And uh, Lambda Calculus is kind of an interesting uh, language. It only had two, uh, two constructs in it. You could define a function like I'm doing here using this lambda operator. So that's how we define a function. And you could call a function. So lambdas and fun calls were like the only things in this language. And it was this complete programming language. You know, in fact, the Lisp language is based on lambda calculus. And the other thing that's cool about uh, Curry and Turing is they're developing these programming languages. 15 years before there is such a thing as computers. So figure that out. Okay, enough history, coming back to Jedi. This is a function call. So uh, here we're calling a user defined function. What's cube of three plus two? Notice that the input here, we call the input, remember the input to a function, it's called an operand and then its expression. We now have, we have operands, arguments, and now we also have parameters over here. Three different, three different ways of thinking about the input to a function. Three plus two is five, five cubed is 125. <clears throat> okay. Uh, here's more complicated function. This is called F to C. This is converting Fahrenheit to temperate to uh, Celsius temperatures. Okay, so lambda, and here the name of my parameter is FT, which stands for Fahrenheit temperature. And uh, here I'm going to use my block, so the body of this function is a block. Okay, the first expression in the block is a declaration. I'm declaring C is 0.55, and then here, the last expression in the block, which is the return value, the value of the block, and therefore the return value of the function, is C times FT minus 32. Okay. And now here I'm going to call it, uh, I'm going to convert 212, that's boiling in Fahrenheit, and we get 100 degrees Celsius. 98.6 body temperature in Fahrenheit, 37 body temperature in Celsius. 32 degrees body temperature are freezing in Fahrenheit, zero in Celsius. Uh, minus 40 as the fixed point. Somebody says, what's the temperature outside? It's minus 40. They don't have to tell you if it's Fahrenheit or Celsius because it's the same in both. And then, uh, and then here I'm going to ask, well, what was C? And I get this error message, undefined identifier, C. And that might seem strange because, look, I just defined C up here. Okay, yes, well, this is where things get interesting with blocks. Because this C was defined inside of a block, it's a local definition. It's a local declaration. So yes, this creates a binding. Remember, binding is the word that I use for uh, a row in the environment, an association between an identifier, C, and the value, 0.55. So this forms a binding, okay? But this binding, C equals 0.55, first of all, was only visible inside of the block. And secondly, only existed. It was temporary. So as soon as we, as soon as we, so so let's be a little bit more careful here. So when I call F to C, okay, this block gets executed. This declaration gets executed. This adds the binding C equals 0.55 to a temporary environment, not the global environment as we've been doing in Jedi 1, but a temporary environment. Okay, I then execute this expression relative to the temporary environment. And now when this thing terminates, 
that temporary environment psh, vanishes, gone. Okay, here I'm calling this again. Again, uh, a temporary environment gets created. The binding is once again created and added to that temporary environment. This expression is executed relative to the temporary environment. And then when we're done, psh, temporary environment's gone. Okay. Uh, so, so here, the temporary, there is no temporary environment. So when you're at the prompt here, the only environment's the global environment. That binding was never added to the global environment. So, so out here, we don't know what you're talking about when you say C. Okay. Um, so here's more. So here I'm defining a new function called times n, okay? And the parameter is lambda n, so I've got this parameter n here. Now, get this, the body of times n is another lambda, lambda of x n times x, okay? So, so this is interesting. We have a lambda nested inside of a lambda. Before we had a block nested inside of a lambda. Now a lambda nested inside of a lambda. So now I'm going to define times five. And times five, I call times n of five. And now what's going to happen here is that um, is that when I call this, I execute the body of this thing. Executing the body of this thing creates a function. This is the function lambda x n times x, but now n is five. So this creates the function that multiplies stuff by five. Okay, uh, and so now I'm gonna call times five of three plus two. Well, that's gonna be five times five, which is 25. You see what's going on here? Times n is a very primitive type of a combinator. Remember what a combinator is. A combinator is something that, uh, well, it's something that takes functions as inputs and returns functions as outputs. This doesn't take a function as an input, but it returns a function as a value. So this function times five didn't exist until I call times n of five. So in a sense, times n created the times five function, not a programmer, but a function creates another function. And that, of course, and somewhere in the backs of your mind, you should be hopefully thinking and your professor's fantasy of what students think about your thinking, uh, and I forgot what it was that I was hoping you were thinking about. Uh, uh, you're thinking, oh, well, the ability to create functions on the fly, that's one of the hallmarks of functional programming. Let's make it even more explicit. Here I'm defining our old friend, the compose combinator. This is a lambda that takes two inputs, f comma g. Okay, and it's going to output a brand new function, lambda of x, which is f of g of x. Okay, so, so this is exactly the function that we kicked off with when we introduced functional programming in Scala. Here it is in Jedi. Okay, we're taking two simpler functions, f and g, and using them to build a more complicated function. So here's a demo of it. So compose is taking two inputs. One of the inputs is lambda x two times x. So that's an anonymous function, right? Again, just like we have anonymous functions in Scala. Remember an anonymous function is a, a function that doesn't have a name. You just create the function on the fly because you just need it temporarily. And then the other function is the cube function that we defined earlier. Okay, so, 
So twice cube is a function which takes uh, as its input some x and then multiplies by two the cube of x. So let's see if that's right. We're going to call twice cube of 10. 10 cubed is 1,000 times 2 is 2,000. Twice cubed of 5. 5 cubed is 125 times 2 is 250. So in this fairly simple extension of Jedi, Jedi 2, we've got all of the ingredients that we need for doing functional programming. So, um, yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Ready for more? Okay. So, um, so uh, here is, uh, we can do recursion. So here's a recursive function, defining fact. This is the factorial function. And we have lambda of n, and the body is a conditional which you've got from which you've got from Jedi one. So if n is zero, return one, else n times fact of n minus one. And here's fact of five is 120, fact of six, six factorial is 720. <clears throat> um, be careful, like if you're gonna paste these definitions in to test them. For some reason, this minus sign, Microsoft Word, which I use to create these web pages, puts in here like some kind of like special hyphen character or something like that. So you'll get an error message if you paste this in. And so basically you have to, you have to type it in yourself, right? Or just replace this by a proper minus sign when you paste it in. Okay, here's some more. Here I'm defining an absolute value function, um, right? If X is less than return is zero, then return minus one times X, else just return X. By the way, on the final exam, I will ask you to implement simple familiar functions in the Jedi language. So I want you to become Jedi programmers, right? And, and what happens when I ask this question in the final exam, some of you will give me the definition in Scala. Some of you will, you know, build the function into the ALU of Jedi. You'll do everything other than simply Pretend like you're a programmer, you know, and the Jedi is your language. So here, for example, absolute value of negative nine is nine. Okay, so that works. And here I'm going to define a global variable delta. Call it global because the binding delta equals 100 will go into the, uh, the global environment. And then here is a function called is small. We've actually bumped into this function before. Is small the is uh, is small is a block, and this is a block with a lambda inside of it. So we've seen blocks nested inside of lambdas, lambdas nested inside of lambdas. It's also possible that blocks nested inside of blocks. Here's a lambda nested inside of a block. So you're going to have to be thinking about these things quite a bit uh, in the future. So uh, in this block, I define, uh, uh, redefine delta. So I have a local binding. Delta is this really tiny little number here. And then uh, I return this function, uh, which is lambda of x, absolute value of x is less than delta. So is small is this function that I've just defined here. Absolute value of x is less than that, right? And so now I ask, is 99 a small number? Yeah, and it doesn't look very small, and apparently it's not, it returns false. Uh, is negative 99 a small number? False. Is this tiny little point 009 small number? True, that is a small number. And then, 
just double checking, what's the value of delta? Delta is 100. Okay, now, um, here is, here is, is a little bit subtle what's going on here, but it's important. Uh, this is a demonstration of the static scope rule. The static scope rule states that when you are executing a function, here we're executing the body of this function, absolute value of x, what's x? Well, x is the parameter here, is less than delta. Now, delta is not defined inside of this function. Okay, so for example, I'm executing is small 99. I'm going to be saying, okay, the absolute value of 99 is 99. Is 99 less than delta? Okay, so I have to now go searching for delta. The static scope rule says that you search the environment where the function was defined, not where the function was called. I'll say that again. Search the environment where the function was defined. Now, this function is defined in an environment where delta was this teeny little thing. It's called here in the global environment where delta is 100. If you use delta as 100, then 99 is small. 99 is less than 100. Okay, but we can see that Jedi is using this value of delta here. The definition of delta where, where the function was defined. Okay, the opposite of the static scope rule is the widely reviled dynamic scope rule, which says use the environment where the function is called. In which case, this is a test case. If you're wondering, well, are we using static scope or dynamic scope? Just see if is small returns true or false here. Now, Dynamic scoping is a disaster because uh, as the, you know, as a, let's say that I'm creating a library of functions that I sell to my customers, mathematical functions, and is small as one of the functions in my library, okay? And uh, let's assume that um, Jedi uses the dynamic scope rule. So one of my customers gets hold of this. One of my customers, unbeknownst to me, happens in his environment to have delta, some, something called delta equals to 100. And so he asks, is 99 small? And this thing returns true. It is small. So the customer flies into a fit of rage. What, 99? 99 isn't small. 99 is big. Why is he saying it's small? And so, you know, he calls up my boss and, and says, oh, your programmer's an idiot. He thinks 99 is small. My boss comes and chews me out. You've got a bug in your code somewhere. And so, you know, I'm going to spend like the next month staring at this code here. And, well, I, I don't see the bug. I mean, it looks like it's okay. It looks like it's okay, right? And, uh, you know, I might get fired over this or something, you know, because I can't see where the bug is. Okay? Uh, there is no bug here. The problem is that we don't really have any control over the environment that our functions get called in. We as programmers, we have control over the environment our functions are defined, but not where our functions are called. Right? Uh, you know, what's the solution here? You know, well, one solution is maybe in the programmer's manual for our language. We could have a little note somewhere saying, hey, please don't define anything called delta because, you know, one of our programmers is using delta for something important, right? Uh, oh, and by the way, you know, here's a list of a thousand other names that you shouldn't use because, you know, our programmers are using them. That would be a very, that's a joke, okay? I don't hear you all laughing, but because you're far away uh, <clears throat> or asleep or didn't think it was funny, okay? Uh, so, so that's not a good solution, right? Instead, what we need is the static scope rule. Okay, why is that a big deal? Well, remember, 
earlier when I was saying that this is a temporary, that this, this binding is added. When you go into a block, you create a temporary environment and, and you know, everything gets executed in this temporary environment. And then the environment, when you're done with the block, goes away. All right, so when I defined is small, then in theory, this temporary environment where delta was this tiny number went away. But here, so that environment's long gone. Here I'm calling it and it still knows about this delta up here. How? How does it know about it? Okay, well, in order to implement the static scope rule, your functions have to carry around with them their defining environments. Okay, so, so, so the environment is not really temporary. That environment lives on because it's remembered by the function. A function we'll see in a minute that remembers its defining environment is called a closure. Okay. Um, so, um, so that's that. Those are the features, static scope rule, recursive functions, higher order functions, combinators, uh, and then just functions and blocks. Those are the features of JEDI 2. <sighs> okay. So, um, so the first thing, the easy thing here is to define, uh, is to get blocks working. Here's a little uh, sort of structure of a block. A block is a, a sequence of expressions. I don't know why I've written it that way. Separated by semicolons and surrounded by braces. Here's block in UML. So block is a special form. And this block has this, this association, has a arrow, you can call it, a block has a list of expressions. And those expressions are of type expression. We don't know what they are. They could be blocks within blocks. Here, for example, executing a block executes each expression in a block and then returns the value of the last one. So here, for example, uh, the first three expressions, right, one, two, and three, I use those because we'll be able to see them get executed. They produce si visible side effects. And then uh, here's the value of the block, one plus two plus three. So here's the one, two, three. These are the side effects produced by right one, right two, right three. Uh, I think right returns as its value some notification like done. Okay, but we're not seeing the done notifications because they weren't caught here, right? They just floated off into cyberspace. And then this six is the value of the block. There's a more practical example here. In this block, define X is one, define Y is two, define Z is three. And now I'm gonna do X plus Y plus Z and it's six. Of course, if I say, well, what's X? It's undefined because it was temporary. It set up a temporary environment. Okay, so it's pretty much the way, I mean, it's the same way that blocks work in all languages, certainly the way blocks work in Scala. Okay, so, um, so the, uh, the trick to this is, um, let's see, how am I gonna do this? Um, I'm thinking for a moment how, if I have like any technology here that would let me do this. Um, Yeah, maybe I'll just do it in paper and pencil. Um, okay, so uh, so the trick for this is uh, we have to use more complicated concept of environment. Okay, and I think hopefully this is the latest code for environment here. So some of you are already using this definition of environment. 
okay? Uh, and let's just take a moment to see, uh, to look at this code. So um, environment, class environment, okay? Uh, it, it extends hash map. So an environment is a hash map. This is a hash map. I remember what a hash map does is it's like basically a two column table. It associates identifiers with values. So for example, if I say def pi equals 3.14, then pi is the identifier and 3.14 is the value. Okay. Uh, environment, I also have this with value. Um, don't worry about that yet. It comes up in Jedi 4.0 where I'm going to be using environments to represent objects. So Jedi 4.0 introduces object-oriented programming to Jedi, and our objects actually are going to be environments, but uh, we'll come back to that later. So environments are happen to be values. And then here's the important part here. Uh, I've got a field, a var field called extension, Okay, uh, which is a type environment. So this is kind of a crazy recursive definition. I'm defining environment, but an environment contains an environment, recursively contains an environment. It's a recursive data structure, okay? So, uh, so, so an environment has a reference to another environment called its extension. This environment, and here the extension could also have an extension, which could have an extension and so forth and so on. So we could chain together these environments as a chain of extensions. The end of the chain has no extension. So by default, extension equals null. The global environment, all of our will see here that that as you're executing JEDI programs, you are building up these long chains of environments. In fact, they're not even chains. It, we'll see pictures uh, where it gets even more complicated than that. Okay, so that means that, uh, that means for example, let's say we wanna know if our environment contains some identifier, true or false, is pi defined in this environment. So here is the identifier that we're interested in, okay? And we're gonna call super.contains name. Now super is, uh, it, 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 so contains is a method of hash map. So it'll look inside of the hash map to see if that name is in there. If it's not in there, okay, then we don't give up, right? Well, maybe it's not in this hash map, but maybe it's in the extension. So if the extension is not null, then we'll ask, does the extension contain name? Now this contains here, is a recursive call to the contains that I'm defining right here. Okay, so it'll look in its super, its hash map. If it's not there, it goes on to its extension. So when we're asking if the environment contains a, you know, a, an identifier like I, we basically look in each hash map in a long chain until we get to the very end, you know, and if we haven't found it by the very end, then this thing's going to return false. Okay, so we can't just give up. The contains can't just look in the contains for hash map. It has to then check the extension, if there is an extension, and see if it's contained in there. Um, what about apply? Now remember, uh, apply is uh, remember apply is is basically how you search an environment. You use this apply function, okay? Um, and so uh, I want to look up this identifier, and this is going to return some value to me. Okay, so so I ask. If super contains name, so if it's contained in my hash map, then super.apply name. OK, 
Okay, so I'm calling the apply inside of HashMap. Again, apply searches, this apply that's shaded here, searches a hash map. Okay, so we'll search the hash map. Okay, if super does not contain name and if the extension is not null, okay, then I'm going to call extension.apply name. Now, this is a recursive call, right? Uh, this is apply calling apply, but with a different implicit parameter. Okay, uh, so, uh, so if, if the extension is null, well, that means that we're at the end of the line here. We're in the global environment. It doesn't have an extension, okay? Uh, and, and it didn't contain the name, so name is not contained in this, uh, in this environment. So this is where we're gonna throw our undefined exception. All right, we looked everywhere. We looked through this whole chain, and we didn't uh, we didn't find it. Okay. So, what happens in a block? Uh, so we have this block dot execute. Let's see. So block has to implement an execute method. And what you're going to do is you're going to create inside of execute, you're going to create a temporary environment okay, like this new environment env remember is the input to execute, you're going to create a temporary environment, and then you're simply going to go down the list of expressions Remember, this guy's a list of expressions and execute each expression relative to the temporary environment returning the value of the last one, okay? So, hang on one second. I'm gonna see if I can't find a dark pen and maybe uh, go through this with you. Okay, so uh, this is going to be um, a hard part of the class. My granddaughter's artwork all over this paper here. All right, I don't know that this is going to work. Uh, you might uh, want to uh, maybe uh, get out a uh, you see if you can find like a paper and pencil next to you. Um, so you can, I guess I could photograph. Maybe what I can do is I can take a snapshot of this. Have I got that ability here? Um, do this from here and um, share screen, security, stop video. Mm -hmm. um, well, um, I guess I can always do it um, somehow using the cameras, uh, camera, uh, the computer is a new computer for me, so I'm going to have to uh, rehearse how to, how to do that. Okay, um, let's see, maybe I can do some of this on um, okay, so um. Okay, so let's do this. Let's do 
this as we just write. So here we are in the Jedi interpreter. I'm going to define X and this is probably going to say OK. Now I'm going to do this def um, Y equals 20. Take a moment to think about this. So, um, so here is uh, x is ten. Now we're going to go into a block. And the first question I have for you is, how many expressions are in this block? What's the length of the block in terms of number of expressions? So everybody, think of an answer. Let's see if I can use my use my powers of magical powers to like discern what the majority of you are saying. Ah, yes, you're correct. There are two expressions in this block. There's this expression, which is a declaration, and there's this expression, which is a block. Remember, a block. It takes a bunch of expressions and lumps them together, groups them together as a single expression. Okay, so I'll execute this guy. We're going to create a temporary environment. When we enter this block, we create a temporary environment. And in that environment, we have y equals 20. Am I sharing this with you? Yes, okay. Never sure with all these windows, they pop up. And now we have a block within a block. Okay, so we create, a, so this temporary environment extends the global environment. And now this temporary environment extends the temporary environment we just created. And here I've got a local variable called z, which is 30. And now we're going to do x plus y plus z. Okay, so. So what is Z? Well, we look in the temporary environment, Z is 30. So I'm gonna say, let's do it this way. Z is 30. I'll look in this temporary environment for Y, uh-oh, there is no Y here. But uh, this environment extends this environment here in which Y is 20. So my search will continue there. Oh, I see it's 20. So now what about X? I have to figure out what X is. I'll search this environment We're created by this block. No X in there, beginning to get a little bit nervous. But this environment extends this environment. Oh, there's no X there either, so now I'm getting really scared. And so the, this environment extends the global environment in which X is 10. And that is, that's the answer that gets produced. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to draw, uh, I'm going to go through this example again, okay, and um, if x equals 10 is stored locally, no, uh, x equals 10 is stored in the global environment. So remember, the global environment is created in the console, and that environment persists until you quit out of uh, Jedi. Okay, so uh, so I'm going to try to draw a picture of this for you, and the kind of picture I'm going to draw is called an environment diagram, and uh, this is going to be a challenge for me. I mean, we draw a lot of environment diagrams from this point on. Environment diagrams are also featured on the uh, on the final exam. You have to draw some environment diagrams. Um, and to be honest with you, I hadn't really thought very hard about how 
I'm going to do this you know, remotely. So, um, so, but let me give it a shot. Um, Need a moment. Okay. So I don't know why I haven't got speaker view for me. Um, Here um, is my initial thing here. It looks like, is it backwards for you? Yeah, it probably is backwards, isn't it? Uh, I don't think I can draw these things backwards. I will take a photograph when we're done with this. And, you know. Oh, it's not backwards. Oh, okay, great. great. Maybe it's just backwards for me. So this picture that I have drawn, okay, is it's labeled GE. GE stands for global environment. If you look at the code for console, you'll see where the global environment is defined. Okay. Uh, in this global environment, so all of my environments, this is a hash, think of this as a hash table, a hash map. Okay, the, the left-hand column is identifier. I just wrote ID in there for identifier. And the right-hand column is the associated value. I just wrote VAL. And uh, so we're at the point now where we've just completed the definition of X equals 10. And so we see that row in there, x equals 10, okay? Now, what happens next is we execute a block. And um, let's remind myself, uh, y equals 20. So in that block, uh, we execute the declaration y equals 20. And at that point, we just finished executing y equals 20. This is what the environment, I'm going to give this guy a name. This is what my environment looks like at this point. Okay, so, so the new environment that I created, because I entered that block, I'm calling it TE1 for temporary environment one. Okay, and then inside of temporary environment one, I'm going to go down the list of uh, expressions in there and execute each one. And I've just finished executing the first one, which was def y equals 20. So that binding y equals 20 goes into TE1. Now you'll also notice that TE1 extends GE. Okay, so TE1 is an extension of GE, the global environment. Next expression is yet another block. So again, you begin by creating a temporary environment. create a temporary environment extending the current environment, and then you execute everything in that environment. And here's the picture now. Okay, so you see TE2 over here extends TE1, 
which extends GE. Okay, that's because we have a block inside of a block. Okay, and now I've written underneath it X plus Y plus Z. That's the last expression in that inner block. And so now I've got to figure out what X plus Y plus Z is. So I'm going to search this environment for, for X, let's say, and there is no X in here. So I don't panic. I do panic, but you don't have to panic. I go to the extension. And now I'm going to search the extension for X. There's no X here. So again, uh, this is the apply method that I was showing you. I'm going to search here, ah, X is equal to 10. So I now have I now have, okay, see that cut. This is a ridiculous way to do things. I've got 10 plus y plus z. And now I do apply y, search for y. It's not in TE2, but you can see it in TE1. I'm just going to cut to the chase. I'm doing all of this calculation here. Okay. Uh, so I searched for Y. I found it in TE1. Uh, I searched for Z, which is right there in TE2. And now 10 plus 20 plus 30 is 60. And now these temporary environments were created inside of block.execute, right? Created inside of block.execute, which means that TE1 and TE2 are local. They're inside of these methods. When those methods terminate, what happens to them is what happens to any local value. It turns into garbage and it's going to get swept away eventually by a garbage collector. And so, what I do is To indicate that, I draw these cross out lines here to show that TE2 now goes away. We're now in the outer block, but that just terminated. So it's TE1 goes away. Okay, and we're back to where we just have the global environment. So now back in the global environment at the prompt, if you want to know what's Y, what's Z, well, uh, you're completely out of luck because the environments that contain those bindings are now getting ground up by a garbage collector somewhere. <laughs> so what I would like you to be able to do is, uh, is to, uh, we'll set up like a little lab for this, uh, some maybe next week. So I'd like you to be able to draw these environment diagrams. And the way that uh, I set it up for you is that you draw the environment diagram and then you take a, take a photograph of it using your camera on your computer or your cell phone or whatever. And then you upload that to, that, that to Canvas. So that's how you'll do it. I've, I've always had the luxury of having miles of whiteboard in front of me to do these diagrams. Uh, so this is the first time that I've you know, ever had to experience you know, what it's like to be in your situation. Okay, any questions about, um, about block? Let's go back to screen share. All right, so just to be clear, your first move here is to create this class called block. And then inside of block and block, you should be able to translate this directly into Scala. Block has a list of expressions. And also you'll have to put execute in here. And then your execute, you'll create a temporary environment out of whatever environment is passed in. And this env here, could be the global environment, or as we just saw, it could be like TE1, right? So you don't know and you don't really care. 
And then you go down that list of expressions, you execute each expression in the list and return the value of the last one. And just as a tip, you know, try not to, try not to execute anything twice. Okay? It doesn't matter in Jedi 2, but it will matter when you have side effects and things like that. You're going to generate the side effects twice if you execute something twice. So avoid, you know, trying to execute. That happens when you get to the last expression, right? Somehow you have to keep track of that. Okay. All right. Shall we move on? The, the environment, the blocks environment. I mean, there's also the parser for blocks. Let's see. Um, yeah, let's take a quick look at that. Let's see what I've given you here. Now here's your parsers, Jedi 2 parsers, extends Jedi 1 parsers. So that saves you a whole heap of work. Right, because uh, you, you know you don't have to redefine all of those parsers in Jedi One. You're just going to inherit them, okay? Um, and then here is the um, here's the EBNF for a uh, rule for a block. Block consists of a left curly brace followed by an expression followed by. And here we have zero or more expressions preceded by semicolons, and then followed by a closing curly brace. So you're gonna translate this into, into Scala Combinator, okay? And it should be pretty easy. So, so this is probably gonna be a rep little arrowhead here to drop the semicolon. So that's gonna give you either a single expression, or it's gonna give you an expression from here, followed by a list, which could be the empty list or not. And so you'll just cons this onto this and then feed that to your block constructor. So it's pretty easy. You'll also, I put block here, I don't know if it's a good idea, I've redefined here, I'm overriding term, inherited from Jedi one parsers. My new value of term, is lambda, so that it could be a lambda expression, it could be a fun call, or it could be a block. So I've added, that's where I'm adding lambda and block into the term parser, okay? Um, so it's gonna be pretty easy. You just have this block. If, you're, if your Jedi one parser is working properly and you're confident in it, then this is totally, this parser is totally easy. You need a block parser, a lambda parser, what's a lambda? It's the string lambda followed by params followed by the body, which is an expression. And params is, this is very similar to operands. It's a list, zero or more comma separated identifiers. Okay, so, so uh, basically you're just gonna copy the operands parser for the params parser. And you're done. You're done. Um, okay. Um, next. What are we doing? Time. So next, uh, we're going to introduce closures. Closures are incredibly important in computer science, and you know really good programmers, you know, are you know, very fond of closures. When you execute a lambda, like that lambda of x, x times x times x, uh, it produces a value. What kind of a value does it produce? Sharing this, yes. What kind of a value does it produce? Well, lambda of x, x times x times x produces a function as its value, okay? So we have to have functions as a new kind of value. But then, uh, as I warned you, our functions in, in languages like, like Scala or uh, Jedi, 
also have to lug around with them the environment where they were defined in. Remember, that's important for the static scope rule, which is very important. Um, you know, it wasn't until the scheme language, the scheme dialect of Lisp came out in a, like 1979, I think it was. That was the first point in time where people had finally figured out how to implement the static scope rule in an interpreted language. It's easy to do in a compiled language, but our, nobody knew how to do it for an interpreted language. So we're following the technique used uh, back in 79 for uh for scheme so uh so instead of function a function that carries around its defining environment we call it a closure okay and here closure is a new kind of value so this is going to go in your value package it's a new kind of value that we're introducing and the closure has three components it's got uh, a list of parameters Parameters are just identifiers, X, Y, Z, whatever. It's got a body, so this is the X times X times X part, which is some kind of an expression. And over here, it's got its defining environment, which it has to remember. Okay, and then there's, uh, inside there's gonna be an apply method. Okay, and it's going to get, I think this is a typo, args here should be a list of value, I think. Those are the inputs. Okay, and now think a little bit about in the ALU execute. There too, it gets a list of, of values. Args is a list of values. This is the same thing, uh, but it's going to be, uh, so it's going to be, this is the same thing, but it, you know, it's a user-defined function. Okay, now um, um, let's see how apply works. Let's see if I'm giving you any hints here at all, like I am. Um, what to say? Um, let's do it this way. So I'm skipping over lots of uh, the fields and so forth. I guess the fields are going to be defined up here. So confused between 282 and 151, which is all Java. So here, you know, you're going to have, what are you going to have? You're going to have grounds, you're going to have body, you're going to have uh, a def in the, just like we had. So, um, so here we're going to create a temporary environment. So here we're going to create a temporary environment, which extends, and this is where the uh, static scope, scope rule comes in doesn't extend the current environment, it extends, remember we remembered our defining environment, that's what it's going to extend, okay? And then we're going to uh, bind params, args, and v. So, so here we have our parameters, X, Y, Z, and here we have our arguments, two, three, four. So X is two, Y is three, Z is four. So that's what I mean by binding parameters to arguments. And those bindings are gonna go in this temporary environment. And then finally, what are we gonna do? We're gonna do body.
we're going to execute the body relative to the temporary environment. So that's uh, that's a sketch of uh, that's a sketch of this apply method here. Okay. Um, what time it is? Yeah, I'll, one little comment, we'll come back to this a little bit later, but something interesting here is that I have told you that the important, the most important dichotomy is in programming languages is the dichotomy between value and expression. Right? Expressions are questions and values are like the answers, right? Uh, they overlap a little bit in literals, but you know, we generally keep expressions and values separated in our mind. But look at this, closure is a value, but it has an expression inside of it. So what we're gonna see a little bit later um, is that, is that a closure is a way of like taking an expression and deep freezing it, flash freezing it. Uh, normally you type an expression. Let's go back up here for a second to see this is kind of a philosophical point. But so normally when you type in X times X times X, this is you want it executed now, right? So if I just typed in X times X times X, you know, we try to execute that. Okay, this is an expression. But when you put it behind a lambda, you are flash freezing it. You're putting it, picture that this blue shaded box around it is like a, a block of ice. So I've taken this expression and I put it in a block of ice. No, I don't want to execute it now. I want to execute it later on is what I'm saying. Okay, and that later on comes when I call the function, I call cube of three plus two. That's the point at which I'm taking it out of the freezer, I'm thawing it out and executing it there. Okay, so we're postponing uh, this. Now, in software engineering, this comes out as what's called the abstraction principle, okay, which is that you know, I should be able to take a block of code, take a, here's a block of code here, okay, and give it a name, okay, and only when that name, and then execute that same block over and over again, uh, each time I call the function, okay? So, so, I mean, imagine, for example, I have like a big, some sort of weather, weather uh, tracking program, Right, and there are thousands of places in there where I have to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. And each place where I do it, uh, you know, I write down this code okay, over and over and over again. Right. Well, first of all, it's going to be really like hard to maintain that code. And secondly, if if I've made a mistake, maybe I said 0 0.54 here. Right? Well, I've got to go find every one of those places and change it. Okay, instead, and that's kind of what you more or less have to do in assembly language. Uh, the abstraction principle says, all right, I want to take this block of code and I want to make a new instruction out of it. Okay, so I'm going to create a brand new instruction that wasn't built into the ALU, calling this instruction F to C. And now, you know, F to C, I mean, you can't really tell, you know, gosh, is that, is F to C, is that a, programmer defined or is that you know, built into the ALU? You can't really tell, right? And so it's basically a, a way of you taking, creating functions as a, as a form of abstraction. I want you to think of this block of gobbledygook instructions. I, I want you to think of it just abstractly as F to C. Now, formally the abstraction principle states something like, uh, given any module, class, function, and so forth, you should be able to use it without understanding how it's implemented, okay? And so we have that here, right? Uh, I mean, for example, when I was, you know, a student in high school, I think it was, 
to make this story short, I know you're anxious to go. I was really good at trigonometry. I know my trig identities, I could prove everything, blah, blah, blah. You know, and it wasn't until calculators came out. No, they didn't have calculators when I was in high school. Uh, and, and even when I was in college, only rich kids had calculators. When calculators came out, they had a little button on it for calculating sine. And it was at that point I realized, gosh, you know, I consider myself really good at uh, trigonometry, but I actually have no idea how this button works. How, how is the sine function implemented? So it took a while, you know, I mean, before I realized, oh, you know, it's like, you know, the Taylor series approximation or something like that. But, but I got quite far in trigonometry without actually knowing how to implement the sine function, right? And if you're like a, a weather guy, you can write really amazing, you know, weather forecasting programs. And maybe you don't know the algorithm for converting Fahrenheit to Celsius. I'm sure you probably do, but pretend like this is like some, some um, you know, idiot savant or somebody. You don't need to. Right, because we've abstracted that away. Here, here's this F to C function that you have. Never mind how this is implemented. And, and also notice here that if you come up with a better implementation of this, you can, well, first of all, if you find a bug in it, you know, it shouldn't have been 0.55, it should have been 0.53 or something like that. You only need to fix it in one place. And the other thing to notice is if you come up with a better algorithm, you can replace this implementation with the new one. And since nobody knew how it was implemented in the first place, I mean, it was, in effect, it was our secret sauce, uh, it doesn't change any of your user's code, right? I mean, they just go on, they just maybe notice that, oh, F to C seems to be running faster than it used to run, using less memory than it used to use, blah, blah, blah. Okay. All right. Questions? All right, so I don't see any questions popping up. So, you know, you'll send me an email or you'll come to office hour tomorrow if you have questions. Uh, meanwhile, I'll figure out a way to take a snapshot of this and, and post it to you. All right, I will see you tomorrow or if not, then Tuesday. Oh, Monday is also office hour. So Monday, 10.30 to 11.30 and Friday, 10.30 to 11.30. All right, see you later.